Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We give you glory in this house. We give you glory wherever we are gathered right now. You are holy, Lord. All together different and separate. Lord, we pray that you would reveal and manifest your holiness to us in a fresh and living way. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every soul that's gathered here today to hear the word of the Lord. I pray, Father, that you'd speak through me, that you'd give us wisdom and knowledge, that, Father, you'd give us, by the Holy Spirit, the power to do what you've called us to do so we can be ready to meet you. And we give you the glory and the praise for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's give him one more shout of thanks. Praise today. Hallelujah. I just appreciate this worship team. You guys did a, such a beautiful job today, all of you. So grateful. God has been good. All right, I want to take just a minute and welcome everybody that's with us today, not only here in person, but those that are joining us online uh, from various places around not only New York State, but also Chicago, Burlington, Vermont, uh, Allenhurst, Georgia, Porterdale, Georgia, Tennessee, Virginia, Missouri, Florida, Colorado, and Friedsburg im Breitzgau, Germany. Welcome. I think I said that right. It is great to have you with us today. Let's give a big shout to all of our guests who are with us online. Bless you. <laughs> Believe in for great things in your life. How many of you brought your Bible with you this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, they forgot to bring my Bible out. Could you tell them that they got my Bible back there? There it is. Oh, you got it. I see. All right. Well, if you have your Bible, lift it up and let's thank God for the gift of his word. Father, we're thankful to you for the word. It's full of wisdom and knowledge. Father, help us to learn what your word has to say concerning our relationship with the things that we have in our lives so that, Father, we can maximize what we have for the glory and the honor of God until you return. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, uh, we're going to begin a series of messages that we're calling Kingdom Economics. Everybody say Kingdom, kingdom. Economics. And uh, lest you think this is going to be a boring uh, financial lecture, a uh, series of lectures, that's not the goal here. Our, uh, first of all, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a financial advisor. That's not my role. I'm a pastor. Uh, but it is my role to teach you what God's Word has to say as it relates to the management, the creation, and the distribution of the material things that we have in this life. And it's my responsibility to teach you about it because the Bible teaches about it and uh, speaks specifically to us about how we relate to the things of this world. Now, how many of you know we've been teaching from the book of Philippians, the last section about the, uh, the, gift of, the gifts of giving and receiving. We talked about generosity. And if you're a believer, if you love Jesus, you want to be generous. It's just in you. It's just in you. Your father is generous, and, he, and he, we are born of his nature and image is in us. We want to be generous. We want to be people that, uh, that are able to help and bless others. There's nothing quite like it. Jesus said it uh, in, the, in the book of Acts. It's quoted. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We want to give. There's a blessing in giving. And I believe that everybody in this congregation and everyone that's listening to me, if you know the Lord, it's in your deepest heart, you want to be generous. But so often in life, we're not able to be as generous as we want to be. And very often it's because we're struggling with the financial realities that we have right now. And giving and tithes and offerings and all the things we've talked about are right. But you can walk in the principles of giving and be generous. But if you don't walk in the other principles of God's word, and there's a lot in the Bible that talks about beyond just giving, if we don't walk in the fullness of what God's wisdom says about finances, then even though our giving will be blessed, we will not experience that blessing in our lives. Now, it's really important that we listen to God's message on this because God's message will produce results. The Word always works every time. And I know this about everybody that's listening today. 
Not only do you want to be generous, you want to provide for your families. You want to be able to provide for your children. You want to be able to have some freedom economically and not live in fear. What are we going to do next? Statistics are full of these realities. Divorce, people who are divorcing, 70% of the people divorcing say that money is a first or second reason for their divorcing, either first or second. Uh, it's their difficulties, their fights, their in, inability to come to agreement about economics and money has a huge impact on the ability of that couple to stay together. Uh, we know this, that those who struggle financially uh, often uh, aren't able to make the best decisions that God wants them to make because they're not in the position to take advantage of the opportunities when they arise. And God wants something better for us. He wants us to provide for our families. He wants us to have some, uh, some left over to enjoy the life he's given us. He wants us to enjoy the good things of this world. We've said it before, God isn't opposed to us having things, but he's opposed to things having control over us. The problem is, in our culture today, particularly in the West and in the United States of America, uh, we uh, are owned and run very often by money and material things. It is the obsession uh, of our culture and of our age. And so it's really important when we talk about these things that we separate out from the world's economical views and approaches and we study what does God's word say about economics, finances, and how does that impact my life today? Now, Jesus is coming back, and none of us know exactly when. But I tell you this, when he comes, and it could be tonight, Amen. you and I are going to have a conversation with him about what we did with the stuff he's given us. And God wants us to be ready for that conversation. Now, let me give you a few thoughts. The word kingdom is a word that means God's rule on the earth through his people. God's rule on the earth through his people. In the Old Testament, it was a promise. There was coming a day where the Messiah would come into the world, and through the Messiah, God's chosen one, God's ways of living and doing things would reign over the earth. And it actually promises that when Messiah comes and lives on the earth, there will be no more poverty, no more famine, that there will be justice, that everybody will have more than enough. These are the promises in the Old Testament. And the Jewish people expected those promises to come when the kingdom comes through the Messiah. They were expecting a physical kingdom on the earth that would manifest in spiritual blessing and peace and prosperity for the entire world. That was the promise God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, get away from your family and come to the land I will show you and I will bless you. And those who bless you I will bless and those who curse you I will curse. And through you and through your family, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I'm raising up this family to bless all the families. That was the plan of God all through the Old Testament. Now, it's important for us to recognize we live in a time where, unfortunately, Christianity has separated the, the ideas about material things and spiritual things. And there's a lot of reason for that. It's easy for them to get confused. Now, we can often think that just material things are just when we talk about money and material things, wealth, it's just natural, carnal stuff. It's all going to burn. We can't take it with us, and all of that is true. And we're not to, uh, we're not to seek it. We're not to, we're not to make it our primary objective in life. However, God did make us spiritual beings and put us in physical bodies on a material planet, and the Bible says that God has put these material things on this planet for us to manage for us to develop. And so there is a spiritual nature to the material world. And it's only in Jesus that we can bring these things together in balance. And as Christians, we have the access not only to the kingdom of God through Christ, but we have access to the word of God. And God's word is filled with knowledge about his kingdom and how he wants to rule. Now this second word, economics, I just want you to write this down if you have a minute. The word economics simply is a system of knowledge. Everybody say with me, a system 
of knowledge that's related to the production, the management, and the transfer of wealth. Let's say it again. Economics, you could look this up in Webster's, it would probably say the same thing, is a, is a branch of knowledge, it is a system of knowledge that governs the creation or production, the management, and the transfer of wealth, material things on the earth. And so the question is, does God's kingdom, as revealed in the scriptures, have anything to say about human economics? The answer is yes. In fact, there's no ancient book that has more specific, relatable directives and revelations concerning the principles of economics than the Holy Bible, both Old and New Testaments. It's the foundation of the economic success that came out of Western Europe and has really fueled so much of the prosperity in the United States. Now, I want you to realize that this system of economic production, management, and the transfer of wealth that relates to God's kingdom is what we're interested in. Because we don't just want to produce wealth, have wealth, transfer wealth on this earth for our benefits. We're all about the kingdom of God. We're about the coming of Jesus to the earth, and when he comes, again, he's going to finish what he started the first time. And we're going to see this today in the Word of God. And so we are part of God's plan to manage the material world in the absence of the Messiah until he returns. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open them up to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Now, I don't know if you, if you uh, have ever looked through and seen it, but it is remarkable how much the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus have to do with this idea of stewardship. Stewardship. It's a major theme in the teaching of Jesus. In fact, not only does it appear here in Matthew, but Luke has three separate distinct parables all about stewardship and its results, and each one teaches something a little bit different. So let's take a look at this first one that we find in Matthew chapter 20, 25. Matthew chapter 25. Now, Jesus is giving something called the Olivet Discourse. And what that means is this was the evening before Jesus was going to be betrayed and arrested and then the next day sent to the cross to die. This is his final message, the final thing that he's speaking to his disciples. And Jesus is going to give them something they're going to need to remember. Now, all through his ministry, he talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, that it was near, that it was at hand, and the principles of the kingdom, what it would be like. And as good Jews, they were expecting, now they'd come to believe Jesus was their Messiah, that Jesus was now going to be assuming his role as king, and the whole world would then experience that equality, that blessing, that freedom that I spoke about earlier. They were expecting that, and they thought that Jesus was going to inaugurate that in his first adventure on the earth. But Jesus is going to give them something that I'm sure at the time they didn't fully appreciate. It's only now, after the death and resurrection of Christ, that we can look back and see the wisdom of why one of the last things Jesus said to his disciples is that the kingdom of God is as if someone comes and leaves and comes back. With that thought in mind, let's take a look in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Say far country. Who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now notice he didn't call everyone. He called his own, those who were his servants. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to his own ability. And immediately he went where? 
on a journey. He did something, and then he left. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Everybody say after a long time. So he had received five talents came and brought the other five and said, Lord, you delivered me five. I have gained five more uh, besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful. Everybody say faithful Faithful. servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things enter into the joy of the Lord. He also had, uh, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents beside them. Now, it's not aggregated uh, more. Uh, You know, one guy got two, the other guy earned five. But how many of you know they both doubled what they were given? So the reward was the same. It's not that the quantity of results are going to be the same in every life, but if the quality of faithfulness is the same in every life, the reward will be as great. You see, if somebody is, is, has got a gift in their life that God gave them, an ability and a calling and, and the resources, and they only, they only developed 5% of their potential, when they see the Lord, they're going to be judged on what they did with what they had. And that 5% is a small return on what they were given. But if somebody else has a much smaller level of talent and ability, but they develop it with all that they have, and they put 100% effort into their smaller talent or ability, even though the total amount at the end may not be the same, their actual faithfulness is greater. God doesn't reward us based on the quantity, but the quality of our faithfulness. So the second guy received the same reward. He was good and faithful, even though the total amount wasn't the same. Now, let's take a look at this third fellow who thought he'd just keep, keep it, you know, the same and went and dug and hid it. It says in verse, um, uh, verse 24, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. And look, there you have what is yours. Now I want you to notice this one statement that tells us the core motivation of the guy who hid the one talent. He said, I was afraid. He was afraid. Afraid to risk. Afraid to invest. And so he was just going to put it in the ground and hang on to it. Just so at least, you know, when the master came back, he could give him, you know, what he had given him. That seems like a smart idea, right? Seems like, well, at least, at least, he, at least he didn't spend it. But notice how the Lord responds. He says in verse 26, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with a little interest. How many of you know Uh, the value of of something decreases over time, right? Because of inflation. So he's saying you should have at least put it and gotten 2% or gotten something somewhere, done something with what I gave you, but you just dug it and hid it, and now we're settling accounts, and you're saying, yep, I, I didn't use it, but I still have it. Now I want you to know what the Lord felt about that. He calls them wicked and lazy. People who neglect what God has given them are wicked and lazy. 
So, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just hanging on to it. I'm just putting it aside. Listen, it's an evil and lazy thing to not use what God has given you and to try to get it to grow and do more for the kingdom of God. Notice what he says in verse 28. Therefore, now this sounds really unkind. If, if there was a politician running on this platform today, you can imagine what they would say about him. But Jesus said this, therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have what? Abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, we won't read the next verse, but it's not a pleasant ending for this guy. He says, take the talent from the guy who did nothing with it and give it to the guy who was willing to risk and invest it. This tells us something about when the Lord gives us something, he expects us to do something with what he's given us. He expects us to increase it. Turn to somebody and say, God expects you to do something with what you've been given. Now, let me give you a few thoughts. First of all, this word talent, T-A-L-E-N-T, is an actual sum of money. It isn't a gift or a skill, per se. It actually is talking about a sum of money, and it's a very large sum of money. Um, a talent was equal to about 6,000 days of labor, or 6,000 denarii. A day's labor was one denarii. So, in other words, a talent was the equivalent of about 17 or 18 years of salary. That's one talent. One talent, 17 or 18 years of salary. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's difficult to uh, equate money in that time to money in this time because so many things are different and changed. But this day labor thing is an important principle. It's telling us that it was a very large sum of money. And one guy, he gave basically 17, 18 years worth of income to and told him to do something with it until he returned. He hid it, stuck it in the ground, and didn't do anything with it. The other two took, they even got more. So the guy that got five talents got five times 17 years of salary. Just think about that. And he didn't feel like, oh, what am I going to do with this? I have to hang on to it. I'm going to build a barn and stick it in there. No. He said, I'm going to take the opportunity I've been given, and I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to do the best I can with what I have. And that's the life that God rewards. Now, we know that he's talking about not just money, but spiritual things, and he's using money as a metaphor, material things as a metaphor. But folks, I want you to understand that everything that we have from God is a gift, including the material things that we have. And I want you to notice that stewardship is the principle of managing someone else's stuff. Now take a look with me in the beginning of this parable. It says, he called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Everybody say his goods. His material things. They didn't belong to the people that received them, the servants. They belonged to the master. And this tells us everything is God's. Everything we have is God's. Our body belongs to God. All the wealth belongs to God. Ultimately, this whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We saw this a few weeks ago. But God takes his creation and his blessing, and he gives it to people to, listen, not own, but to steward or manage. Everybody say manage. manage. He delivered his goods to them, and then he went on his journey. And I love how it says that he said, Lord, uh, in verse 18, this one went and dug and hid in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Notice, it wasn't his. It was the Lord's money. It never belonged to him. And he was thinking he was doing the right thing just by neglecting it or leaving it alone. But he was actually uh, disobeying the will of God. God would rather have you take risks with your talents, gifts, skills, abilities, time, and finances in a healthy and productive way. He'd rather have you fail trying to be productive than simply sticking everything that God's given you away for a rainy day and be lazy. 
Productivity is a principle that God has given and a commandment he's given to every man and to every woman on the face of the earth. In Genesis 1, when God made Adam and Eve, what did he say to them? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Take dominion over it. This is your mission. You're supposed to do something with this earth. You're supposed to take dominion. You're supposed to produce. That wasn't just given to Adam and Eve. Every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve, every man and woman has the same commission. We are the image bearers of God. We're made in his image, and God wants us to be fruitful and to multiply. And when you come into the kingdom of God, it's not let's just, you know, give tithes and get mystery checks in the mail and we'll hang out all the time in church and, you know, go on vacations. That is not your purpose in life. I want you to take all the vacations that you want and need, but listen... You can, be, you can have a life of full leisure and you will be unhappy because you were designed to produce. Amen. You were designed to take your gifts, talents, abilities, skills, money, treasure, and time and invest it in a way that produces something else. Amen. And you will be, and sometimes we are deeply dissatisfied with our lives and part of that dissatisfaction is in the fact that we are not being fruitful. We are being lazy. We're not using what we have. And there's never been a generation, I don't mean to be unkind, because I want to say we've all been distracted by the pleasures of this world. There's an old book that was written, I think in the 1700s, called The Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. It's a classic. It's, it's really a Christian allegory, but it's a story of a man who goes on this long journey, and his goal is to get to the kingdom of heaven, so to speak, and he's constantly sidetracked with all of these diversions, all of these diversions all along the way. And you know, that's really what the Christian life is like. We get saved, we're heading towards a heavenly country, but in the meantime, there's all kinds of diversions to what we should put our heart, our mind, our effort, and our focus on. And we have to learn to come back to the center, come back to the beginning, come back to what God has called us to do. Amen. Kingdom economics is simply making a decision that when it comes to your economics, your money, your creation of money, your management of money, your transfer of wealth to the next generation, because there is a generation coming after you, that you're going to do it according to the rule and reign of God's kingdom. That you're going to seek the wisdom in the word of God and seek to apply it in such a way that you will be fruitful, that you'll multiply, that you'll subdue the things that you need to subdue in your life so that when you meet Jesus, you're going to have a nice conversation. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I want that day to be a good one. Yeah. Amen. Now, there's at least at least six things that you have, and you can write these down, that every person has regardless of where they live, what country they're born in, what conditions they're born into. Six things. And in every case, depending on your circumstances, some may have less or more than others in these particular. We're not given equal amounts of these for sure. But we've all been given a body. If you're here today, you have a body. Amen. That's your body. It's not your parents' body. It's your body. But actually, you're just a steward of your body because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 that the Lord purchased your body. Right. So even your body is a gift from God and you have to manage it. Your mind. Your mind. Now, we all have different skills and abilities and the condition of our minds as we uh, mature are very often based on the experiences that we have and the training we have access, access to, and that's not all equal. We know that. But the simple fact is your mind is yours, and what goes on in your mind is your responsibility. And God expects you to do something with your mind. We just finished the book of Philippians. It's loaded with directives about what to think and what not to think. God wouldn't tell us what not to think and what to think if we were incapable of choosing what we think. You can take dominion over your mind. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you. The quality of your life will never rise above the quality of your thinking. Never. And so if you're not having a quality life, you need to deal with your head. 
And that's why the New Testament, I'm going to write a book on what the Bible says about the mind just on the New Testament alone. It is all through the New Testament God says, think about this, don't think about this, put this in your mind, these thoughts, you have the mind of Christ. All, so much about our thinking. We have to guard our mind, our heart, our thinking in the world around us and make sure that our minds are renewed to the kingdom principles that God has given us, not the world's and the cultural principles around us. We've been given a mind. We've been given relationships. All of us have relationships, some more than others, some better than others, but your relationships are something you're supposed to be a steward of, how you manage relationships. In fact, I'm going to tell you, when it comes to economic growth and blessing, and the development and the productivity of your financial life, it is very much contingent upon you having good relationships. Amen. It's just the truth. There's no one that makes it in any level of economic success without some sort of relationship. You have to have relationships with clients. You have to have relationships with bosses, with coworkers, with, with uh, people that you're selling to. You have to re have relationship with people that, uh, that often are going to open doors for you that you can't open yourself. That's right. I'm so thankful for the relationships that I have in my life. I wouldn't be who I am, where I am, and what I have today if it wasn't for those amazing relationships. And you have to care for those relationships. You have to steward those relationships well. That includes your spouse, that includes your kids, that includes your parents. There's a whole thing in the Word about how you treat your parents, and we're going to talk about it. Because a big reason a lot of people aren't prospering is because they are not honoring their parents. Amen. Well, they didn't honor me. It's not about them, it's about you. Turn to somebody and say, I need this. Relationships are essential. We have to become good stewards of our relationships. And that takes, that's acquired skill. Some people are more naturally people people than other people. <laughs> but all of us need people. Another thing that you've been given that you have to be a good steward of is your skills. Everybody is born with particular, now this is how I'm going to use the word talent, not in the same way that Jesus is using it in relationship to money, but talents, abilities. All of us have different di abilities and talents. Some people are athletically inclined. Some people are intellectually inclined. Some people are uh, artistically inclined. Some people are business inclined. Some people are inclined towards human relationships, human service. There's several different kinds of inclinations that we have. And with each one of those are particular skills and abilities that you are just naturally great at that other people can't do like you can. I'm in awe of anybody that has an accounting mind. I've learned to be able to read financial reports and seek the Lord about what they mean. But there's some people, they just think that way. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm in awe of people that are talented when it comes to athletics they just, it blows me away when I see an incredible gymnast or a, a great uh, Olympic athlete. It just, it's just incredible. And you know how much work and time went into that. But in some cases, these people were just talented and then they developed their talents, right? Each one of us have natural skills and abilities. Now, this is important. The key to your providing financially for your life is to discover what your natural skills, talents, and abilities are and to become a good steward of those things. You need to develop them. Because that's the key to your success in your natural life. I'm going to say it again. The key to your success in your natural life materially is related to you developing the natural abilities that God gave you that are, exist in your body and mind to the fullest extent and then deploying them in the marketplace. That's how God provides for you. So we need to become skilled at things. We need, there's, I'm telling you right now, there's, there are things that you may be brilliantly skilled at that you haven't even learned that you can do yet. Sometimes we discover we have talents and abilities along the way, right? But whatever those are, it's important for us to steward them well and do the best we can with what God has given us, and it's a key to success. Another, and, and by the way, neglecting your skills, talents, and abilities uh, means that you're going to impact your ability to produce and prosper for yourself and for others. Now, we've also all been given some measure of money, body, mind, relationship, skills, money. Now, some may be born with very little, 
But unless you were born in the forest, you were given something. You were given, uh, you know, swaddling clothes or diapers, and you, 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 you slept on something, right? I mean, you, you had something that was provided for you that you didn't work for, that you didn't earn. And each one of us, and this is the reality of life, it's not equitable who gets more to start out with than others. Unfortunately, human society and culture and all sorts of things have made it more difficult for some people than for other people, and we acknowledge that. But here's the thing you need to realize. Even if you're behind the eight ball, you didn't come from a family that has a lot of natural wealth. You didn't have a lot given to you. You weren't able to go to a school that had all the advantages that the other schools maybe 20 miles away had. Uh, maybe you didn't have uh, both parents in the home. You didn't have, uh, maybe the parents that you did have were addicted or weren't always living the way that they should live and weren't loving you consistently. All those things are tough. I'm not saying they, aren't, uh, they, aren't, they don't contribute to your pain. But there comes a moment where you and I have to decide, I'm not going to define myself by being a victim of the circumstances I've experienced. Because all of those things, as bad as they are, and they, can, they affected how I think and behave, and, and I, but I'm responsible to challenge those things and to use the mind that God gave me to reach up for something better than I've known. You know, there's a lot of folks that are born, you know, trust fund babies. They're born with lots of wealth. Their college is paid for. They never really know what it's like as kids growing up to not have anything. And a lot of times, the kids that grow up without knowing struggle, they actually waste the money their parents gave them later. In fact, the percentage of wasteful, first-generation wealthy kids is so high that, that uh, we need to take a lesson from that. It's not about having everything. It's about learning to take what you have and do the best you can with what you have. Amen. Amen. The greatest stories in Scripture and in our own culture, our own world, are stories of people that came from behind, that came from nothing, that came from, from disadvantage and through effort and work and relationships and skill and prayer, they began to leverage the little they had and it began to grow into something that could bless others. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've been given something and God wants you to do something with it. You know, the money that God's given you is not just for, you know, so much of our money we, and you can just take a look at your bank statement or your debit card statement and look how much of that resource that comes in goes to passing entertainments, subscriptions to things that we really don't need right now, purchases of beverages, indulgences, food, ice cream, nothing wrong with some of that, right? Nothing. But the point is, so much of the wealth God gives us, we end up releasing, consuming through our mouth and releasing in our toilets. Now, there are people really starving, and there is food insecurity, even in our own city. But most of the people I know aren't having a problem with not having something to eat. Doesn't mean they don't exist, and, and, and we, we take care of folks who struggle with that. But the point is, when God gives you money, yes, you need to consume some of it, but how much of that has just, just goes away to things that we, are one-time experiences or turns into fertilizer? What if we pulled that back? What if we recognized that, yeah, we need to spend some on food and some on entertainment, but you know what, first, we got to take care of this. If you can't tithe, you shouldn't be buying a lotto ticket. I'll tithe when, I come, when my ship comes in. Wait till I hit the numbers. Well, we have a lot of people, there's a lot of lotteries today, and a lot of people have made a lot of money, and the reality is 70% of the people who win big in the lottery lose it all within two years. 70%. Because if you don't have the mindset to develop that kind of wealth, you won't have the mindset to keep that kind of wealth. God's way to blessing and prosperity is far wiser, 
It's not about you reaching a dollar amount. It's about you living a life that is consistent with his calling, his purpose, meeting your needs, you learning to live in a disciplined way where you have enough left over to be a blessing, and where you can trust God and believe God to take what he's given you and to increase it. It's not about everybody having the same pile, size of pile at the end of your life, or having the same amount of possessions at the end of your life. It's not about a particular level. It's about us learning to use what he's given us in the context in which we live and producing something valuable with it that is not just about us. It's about the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we are commissioned. I want you to notice this in this parable. Not only does he give them all talent, which we're defining as body, mind, relationship, skills, money. Oh, and the last thing, the last thing you've been given that you have to steward, time. Time. Time is actually, I put it last, because it is the most valuable asset you have. And the reason is, you're spending it every day. You have to spend a click, just like this. Every second, you only have so many seconds that make up so many minutes, that make up so many hours, that make up so many days and months and years. And uh, if we get 80 spins around the sun, 80 years, that's a, that's a relatively, to, by today's standard, that's a good life. Now, praise God, if you want to go into overtime and get to 100, 120, you go for it. Right? But here's the thing, not everybody makes it to 80. But the moment you're born, you start spending the clicks. And they never stop. They never stop. You only have so many clicks to get your mind educated, so many clicks, so many moments to build to invest in good relationships, so many clicks, so many moments to develop your mind, so many clicks, only so many moments to begin to invest and to grow things over time. And, you're, and here's the thing, you can't save your clicks, you have to spend them whether you like it or not. It's what, it's not, we all have time and none of us know how much we have, which means it's really precious. Because sometimes you may think you've got a lot more time than you do. It's not about just, you know, trying to hoard time. It's learning to do the best you can with the time that you have. Am, am I spending my clicks in a way that is, I'm going to feel good about tomorrow? Am I spending my time today? Did I just really spend three hours on Facebook? Did I really just spend an hour and a half on, on TikTok? Did I really just spend... And listen, I'm not just spending an hour and a half of time. See, time is life. Where you spend your time, you spend your life. Where you waste your time, you waste your life. You never get it back. I love television. I enjoy it. I love drama. It's part of what I wanted to get into at one point in my life. But I got to tell you something. I, I have to watch that. I mean, not just watch it, but I mean, I have to be aware of how much time I'm spending. You know, so many times the reason your book isn't written is because you wasted it on some binge-watching series. What if you took the two hours a night that you were spending in front of the television, reduced that to, you know, just by one hour, you'd have seven more hours a week. That's practically a work day. And you'd have 52 days more a year in work just by one hour a night. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how things add up, but we don't see that, and we live in an impulsive culture. We want to do what feels good in the moment, and we're going to have to learn. We're going to walk in kingdom economics, which is the management of our, not just wealth, but of our bodies, our minds, our relationships, our time, and our skills. We're going to have to become aware of what we're doing with our time. And if we're spending large amount of times flowing towards things that don't produce, just sitting down and watching somebody else's creativity, but it's not building anything for me, then, then see, see it's, it, the devil is so brilliant. He's created these amazing distractions. No, no generation up until the last hundred years has had to deal with them. Even driving in your car, you've got radio and you can, DVD players and podcasts and all kinds of things. And those things, there's great wisdom and knowledge and all of that. But, you know, 
we can spend so much time just putting our life into all of these things where other people are successful, but it's, we're not taking that time to make ourselves what we could be to produce with the gifts that God's given us so that when we meet Jesus and you're going to meet Jesus, he's coming back, you can have a pleasant conversation. And that's the whole point of this parable. Jesus is telling his disciples, listen, I'm about to leave. Now, you're not expecting this because you assume that the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God on earth through Messiah was, you know I'm Messiah, was going to start and now we're going to rule over the world and bring justice and equity. I got to tell you, when he did this through a series of parables, I'm going to go on a long journey. I'm going to a far country. I'm going to Father's house to prepare a place for you. I'm leaving, but I am coming back. In the meantime, I'm going to give to each of my children, my servants, not the whole world, my servants, talents, investments according to their abilities. And I want you to do business until I come back. Make, develop, produce those things, cause them to grow, and when I come back, we're going to settle up. Amen. Amen. I just want you to look at Romans 14. Romans 14, and let's, we'll close with this verse. Uh, let's take a look at verse, we'll start in verse 10 because it picks up the theme. He said, why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the what? Judgment seat of Christ. This word judgment, bima, means the assessment seat. It's the place where athletes were assessed and rewards were given out. In the Greek, he's saying there isn't a seat, there is a seat where we're going to be assessed and rewards are going to be given out. And we're all, and he's talking to Christians here, all going to stand before that seat of Jesus Christ. Just say, I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us will. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess or admit to God. Every tongue's going to not only bow at that seat, everybody's going to say something. Verse 12, so then each of us, everybody say each of us, shall give account of himself to God. Everybody say each of us shall give an account of himself. Years ago, the Lord showed me this, and he said, you know, people think that when I I see them in the judgment, at the judgment seat, that I'm going to tell them about themselves. And the Lord showed me and said, no, no, you're going to do the talking. Every tongue will confess to God. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord's going to push a little button inside of you. It's a button that has recorded every action, thought, deed, and and, and moment of your human lifetime. And he's going to touch that button, and out of you is going to come a beautifully edited soliloquy of your life. You're going to actually talk to Jesus about your life. Here's what I did. Here's what I did right. Here's what I did wrong. There's going to be part of your brain that's going to want to cover your mouth, but you're going to sing like a bird before the judgment seat of Christ. It's just going to come out. Just like when, when uh, my, uh, my son Caleb, when he got in trouble, and we would sit down with him, and we'd look at him, and we knew he was lying, we'd just keep saying, now what's the truth? Suddenly he'd just start singing like a bird. It would just start coming out of him. <laughs> One time he tried to cover his mouth. It just kept coming out. And that's what's going to happen on steroids when you see Jesus. You're going to give an accurate assessment of your life. You're not going to be able to BS him. You're not going to be able to say, oh, this was really great. Build up something that wasn't true. You're going to speak absolutely what happened to God. And the Lord already knows it, but you're going to get to hear yourself give the account. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians about this same experience that he that has done good things with his body will receive a reward. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that those who don't do the right things with their body, they're going to suffer loss. doesn't mean they're not going to heaven, but they're not going to experience the great blessing and the reward they could have had. Here's the reality. 
You can be thoroughly saved and live a half-committed Christian life. Give the Lord a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you'll have a little productivity. But at the end of your life, you're going to meet Jesus, and Jesus is going to talk to you about the possibility that you didn't achieve, the potential you left on the table. Not because he's trying to make you feel bad, but because that's part of accountability. Jesus is on a journey, but he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's receiving that kingdom from his father, and he is going to establish himself as king over the earth. In the meantime, he's called his servants, that's the church to him, and given each to us some talents, time, abilities, skills, positioned us throughout history, and said, now go and do business until I return. It's our job now to be productive. It's our job to fill our lives with something that's meaningful so that when we have that big conversation someday, we're going to have a lot of good things to say. And most importantly, we want to hear him say this, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over much. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, as we go into this series, I want you to come with notebooks, your Bible. We're going to literally divine out of Scripture the principles of God's Word concerning stewardship for ourselves. And I believe with all my heart that as we do this together as a church community, God is going to set us free. The Lord has spoken in my heart that there are many of His people that are in bondage financially. You may have a job, but you're in debt and you don't know how to get out. You may, you may be working, but there are needs and you do not have right now the ability to meet those needs. That happens to all of us from time to time. But if we'll walk in God's wisdom with God's help and faith and focused effort, we can get out of that. We can move into a place where we're living in the economy of God and we'll have what we need and we'll love what we have because it comes from the Lord. So I want you to continue on this journey with me as we go along. It'll be a blessing to your life. Have you been blessed by the word of God today? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you so much for the word of the Lord. Jesus, though we are talking in some ways about finances, it's more than that. As we've seen today, it's what we do with our minds, our bodies, our talent. What we do with our time, Lord. What we do with the relationships you've given us, Father. Lord, I think all of us can say in one way or another, we've fallen short in some of these areas. But Father, we thank you that you're merciful and gracious, and we ask you to forgive us for where we have stumbled. And Lord, let us build where we are right now. Let us begin to think of ourselves as stewards so that we have a good report when you come back. In the name of Jesus, Father, put this spirit inside each of us so that we can become productive for your kingdom and glory regardless of what's happening in the world today. Let me give you the praise and the thanks for it. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're here and you'd say, Pastor John, um, you talked about the Lord coming and us giving an account of our lives. Uh, I'm not ready to meet Jesus. If he was to come tonight and I was to stand before that judgment seat or if I was to leave this earth this afternoon, I'm not ready to stand before him and give an account of my life. If that's the case, it all begins with accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, giving your heart to him, asking him to come and to forgive you and to save you. Turning your life over to him begins the journey with Jesus. And you can do that right now. I'm going to ask you wherever you are, whether you're standing or sitting, Every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor John, I'm not ready to meet Jesus, but I want to be. I want to be. Lift your hand up so I can see it all over this house. Lift it up high. God bless you. God bless you. Are there others? Lift them up high. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In just a minute, I'm going to pray and we're going to dismiss, but I'm going to ask you who lifted your hands or should have and didn't to make your way up to this altar. We have a team of prayer uh, prayer leaders that are going to take a moment to pray with you and you're going to receive forgiveness, blessing, and direction from the Lord. So come forward and receive the Lord today in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody just say this after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I surrender my life to you. Help me, Father, to be a good steward. 
of the life you've given me. Where I've fallen short, give me faith to confront and to face what I need to face and to make the changes I need to make so I can be ready to meet you. I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your lives this week as you seek and serve him in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We just heard an incredible message from Pastor John all about stewardship. There's six areas that we can steward. So I want to encourage you to take those things and hopefully you took some notes and do an inventory in your life and say, hey, which of these areas am I stewarding well? Which of these areas can I use some work on? Which, which are some areas that I can more focus on? Maybe it's your body and maybe it's what you treat your body and, and the, what you eat. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe you're just kind of frivolously spending, whatever that may be, or maybe it's your time. We, I, I know that's one for me where I tend to waste time and social media, other things. So maybe there's some areas in your life that you can work on stewarding better, cultivating what you have to maximize its potential. So I wanna encourage you to take this message, think about it, put it in your heart, and, and find the areas that you think God can work with you to improve yourself. Now, if you raise your hand digitally today to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior for the very first time, first of all, thank you and welcome to the kingdom of God. Secondly, we wanna follow up with you. This should not be something that you do by yourself. When we're saved, we're both saved vertically to God and also horizontally to a community. So please engage with us. There's, there's an online host. If you can, engage with them. Tell them, hey, I, type in there, I got saved. And let them communicate with you. If you're watching this later, then just reach out to us at AbundantLife.Church slash get involved. Right there you can find an, a form called the next form. And fill that out and we, we will send you to your next steps. Get you connected with people that can help you grow into your relationship with Jesus and help you become the best version of you in the kingdom of God. So thank you so much for being with us today. We are looking forward to the next time that you're with us. We're going to be here every week. So come on out next week if you're around. Come in person. Come to the church community. This is a great place to do it. And if you're online from wherever you're watching, whether it's around the country or around the world, may God bless you wherever you're at. May God abundantly give you community and a faith-filled community where you can plug in and be a part of something awesome. We love you, and we will see you next week. See you later.